episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to a special episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I am your host. Hello. And, uh, well, check it out. We have decided that today is a special Musician Spotlight episode. We've been toying around with names all week, actually for the last five minutes, and we came up with that. So, first of all, what do you need to do? You need to subscribe on our YouTube official channel. The button is right over here, or over there, somewhere where I'm pointing. And if you are listening to us on an audio platform, whether it's Apple Podcasts, a Spotify, a Stitcher, any of those, thank you very much. But we really want you on our YouTube official channel because today, in the trenches, for this special episode, we are about ready to talk the latest book release from a certain lead singer that is simply known to many as Metal God. And just like many of his musical endeavors, the book is getting critically acclaimed reviews. Please welcome into the trenches, Rob Halford. Hello, Rob. Hey, Roxy. Hey, everybody. Man, it's such a pleasure to be in the trenches with you guys today. <laughs> Man, you're in a much warmer trenches than I am. We were just talking about that. It's like I, I'm up here at the North Pole where, where metal is. It's nice and thriving, but it's cold. But you're in sunny, sunny Arizona with my boss, Alice Cooper, somewhere in the same area code. We are. We're in different parts of the world, but this is the great joy of technology, the way we can unite like this. And uh, it's great that we're, uh, that we're both spreading the metal gospel together today. Well, today we are going to spread the word about your latest book. It is called Confess. So as you can imagine, it's packed with high points and low points, peppered with decadence. My first question would be, though, Rob, why a tell-all book now? It's not like you had to have a jump start in your career. Your legacy is completely secured. Um, why a tell-all book right now? Well, I think it's inevitable that people like ourselves that have had this great joy and, and, and journey in rock and roll, uh, at some point, there's an opportunity presented to you by publishers or so forth saying, um, hey, do you want to maybe do a book about this part of your life or that part of your life? And my my reaction to that is if, if, if it's going to be done, I, I would much rather it come from the, you know, the pr proverbial metal horse's mouth rather than an unauthorized biography, which again is something that you really have very little control over. And I think the great thing about the relationship that we build with our fans, with our music, is just having this truthful, honest streak that we share with each other. Uh, so that was one of the main purposes. And then, you know, I'm lucky, man. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for this incredible life that I've been given by uh, metal maniacs around the world. And it's just another extension of who we are as musicians just to put in uh, other factors of our lives, kind of join the dots uh, as we do with our music. And this is me kind of putting it all out, putting it all out there in, um, in not only the written word, but the audio book as well, which was something I didn't expect to do, but I did, I had a blast mic in that. So here you go, this is Confess. This is everything that you want to know about the metal guard. Maybe, maybe not want to know about some of the, some of the episodes. Well but hey, if you, you want, know, if you want to hear all the it. salacious details, if you want to hear all the salacious <laughs> details from his mouth, because not only did you write them, you spoke them because you are on the audio book as well, right? Yeah, I went down to Premier Studios at Indian School Road and had a blast for three or four days there with the, the great crew that run that facility uh, in this in the middle of this COVID thing. It was very well organized and very safe and secure, but. Uh, I didn't expect to do the the audio book. My, my publishers said, you know, do you have any ideas of who you might want to read the book for you? And you have a number of names floating around in your head. But I thought this book is confess. You know, when you confess, it's from the heart, it's from the soul. And so, I, you know, I said, hey, let me have a go. You know, if I don't, if I, if it's no good, we'll find somebody else. But uh, if you would have said OJ I Simpson, <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, let me have a go and, and we'll see how it, how it works out. And and I, I must I must say, I enjoyed it, you know. I mean, my job in Priest, not only as a, as a singer, is also the lyricist. So I love words. I love uh, I love reading. I, I just love that whole literature experience. It was just a, 
a natural step to some extent. I had a producer in, in New Jersey who was like guiding me on the way as and when uh, it was needed, which it was on that occasion. Um, but yeah, the, the book is just a, a real straightforward, honest. I mean, I know it's a sex, drugs and rock and roll thing. That'll always be in rock and roll. That's the circus. But there it is. Yeah, the yeah it's all laid out. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Um, could you compare this book a little bit? It must feel liberating to get it all out there. Could you compare it a little bit to that 1998 MTV interview as sort of like coming out and just like, this is who I am? Or is it completely different? Well, I think it is It is different because there are some incidents that have that I've experienced in my life that have been very private. But I think that the value of the relationship that you have with your fans is based on trust and sharing and loving each other, which is what we have. And so it's like that metal family, you know, and um, metal families share a lot with each other. We support each other through good times and not so good times. And so uh, I just went for it, you know, Ian Gittins, who really is the main guy here, he steered me through this whole process, like almost 50 hours of one-on-one -on -one conversations um, here in, in Phoenix and in, in my hometown in Walsall. And I said to him at the start, I said, Ian, is there anything I should leave off the table? And he goes, it's up to you, but I, I've made a number of these books and, and I just feel the best way rather than kind of having to rethink and, and stumble and stop in your tracks. Just tell me everything, man. Just tell me everything. I'll lead you along the way. Then when we've got it all out, we'll see the transcripts. And if there's something you don't want to to include, then, then we'll look at that then. Which was, again, very liberating in the fact that I didn't have to kind of watch where I should not go in my own mind, you know? Um, right. But I think the, the, the outcome, the outcome has been very candid and very open and very honest, which again, kind of supports the background that I've had um, to some extent, a bit like, like Coop, you know, being clean and sober for all of these years. You got nothing to be afraid of, man. You just, you know, you just speak it from the heart and live it's it. It's great to hear. Out there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, talk about personal stuff. The book does touch on, touch on many personal experiences. I mean, from growing up outside of uh, Birmingham as, you know, with you and the whole band, uh, Judas Priest, working your way up to the top, you know, the highs and the lows. But uh, at the same time, you personally, you're dealing with the perception of other people's thoughts about your own sexuality, for it's, from which I can gather uh, you were pretty comfortable with at a young age because you knew who you were at a pretty young age. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I think I think that's, I've now discovered that for a lot of us, Right from the very, very, very early moments, we we tr we understand the attraction to to a person, regardless of gender. Um, you have no control over it, and that's love. You know, love should be free. Love should be without restraints. You can't lock love. You know, you can't lock love. It's impossible. It's going to find its own way. It's like water. You know, going to the ocean. It, it eventually all goes back into the ocean. <laughs> And so that's how it is with love, you know. And um, having said that, uh, some of us, it takes a little bit later, you know. There's beautiful stories of pe people transitioning, for example. Hey, it's your life. God gives you this gift of life, and it's your life to live thoroughly on your own terms, you know, not on what people assume you should be this way. You, you, you don't do this and don't do that. You know, once you get into that league, you're kind of giving so much of yourself away and you're you're literally uh, turning part of your own life over to another person's point of view. Well, when I was just sitting back for a second, I, I thought I was listening to John Lennon for a second when you were speaking about <laughs> love, your yeah. accent. I, I got yeah. very, very zen at one second for, for a moment. But, you know, the, the relationship you talked about a little bit earlier with your fans and what we were talking about in the earlier years. I mean, did you ever feel that fans would abandon the, you know, would abandon the band when you, you know, if you came out in those early, early years, or wasn't that a, you know, non-issue because, or, or were you actually observing perhaps 
Freddie Mercury and Elton John's sort of, you know, the scrutiny that they had to deal with and, and how was it for you? And, and do you think you ever prioritize, prioritize the band's success, you know, more than your own sexuality in those earlier years? It's, it's an intriguing story um, when you're a public figure, uh, because again, um, things start to pile up on you out of your control. You know, you're carrying this load of obsessions and expectations uh, from other people. And hey, you don't want to let people down. You know, there's nothing worse than, than feeling like you haven't given the best performance on stage, even though you probably have in, internally. You go, oh man, I wish I'd have hit that note. I'm, that note was wrong, or that note was flat, or I, got, I messed up on that line, you know. That's natural. That shows how purely you are connected to your work. So my dilemma, my self-imposed dilemma, was that, hey, you know, if I, were, if I was to come out publicly as a gay man at this point in, in the group, Priest, for example, it could result in irreparable damage. And I think I led myself to believe that possibility just because I was born and raised in a time when not only in my own country, but around the world, gay people were vilified, you know, we were called abnormal, we were called freaks. So you, oh. you build all that into the equation and sure, you're going to be messed up. You know, you're going to have a very, very difficult time trying to ascertain what is the best thing to do, not only for yourself, but for your bandmates and your record label and primarily your fans, especially. Um, of course, as it turned out in the moment that I came out, the 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 uh, the uncertainty that, that that I had floating in my head evaporated because a lot of people went, duh, dude, we already knew to, <laughs> to, hey, man, this is great. Live your life like you should. We don't care. It's all about the music. It's all about the show. And the 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 the, the, the most joyous um, two words in the English language, or, or any language to me is, Unconditional love, unconditional love, you know, accept people unconditionally. And um, and that's what I experienced. And uh, and, and uh, that was just a, a joyous moment. That's great. Your fan, and your fans have obviously applauded you over the years and the world applauds you for opening so many of those doors. Um, you know, I would say, you know, perhaps your story has opened up heavy metal and rock music uh, for many gay people, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's universal, but I, I feel that the acceptance, uh, you've been a pioneer in your whole story speaks to that. You know, the, the, the joy of reading autobiographies for, for many, from any aspect is that, um, there is this content and this value that can be of use. And that's just an, an added bonus, if you will, you know, um, I've already, been getting that feedback from uh, everyone around the world that's that's read Confess. Either, yeah, I've been through the, some of the same uh, situations and dilemmas myself, or I know a friend who has, or a family member who has. I think what what, what this book does um, again is it it just shows you that you know we're all humanity it doesn't matter where you're from whether you're from japan or south america or greece or sweden we're all the same people we're all going through the same beautiful experiences and sometimes difficult experiences in life and it's just a really it's a real beautiful balancing harmonious effect that that i think can be can be of some use and, and hopefully of some value in the, 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 the words of, of uh, confess, confess. I love it. Well, we're going to talk a little about, you know, the shows, the rocks, the things that, that you do for on a day to day life as well, which is playing in front of uh, huge crowds. I've heard you mention before uh, one of the most important shows that uh, Judas Priest ever played, especially in the early days, was opening up for Led Zeppelin in my sort of hometown in the Bay Area. I grew up in Oakland and it was at a day on the green uh, show. I want to sort of hear a little about a bit about in your words, that show and what it meant to you to play with such an iconic band like Led Zeppelin and you guys being on the up and up? Well, it was just a, an incredible uh, end of tour experience for us because Priest had been on the road for months, man. We'd been slugging away 
like all musicians need to do it's like serving an apprenticeship if you will learning about your band your music the fans that you meet around in this particular case america we've been on the road for months you know playing five six shows seven sometimes seven shows a, a week and then traveling you know overnight between between gigs so we were almost coming to the end and then word came to us through management that robert plant had said hey i hear priests in america we would love them to open up for us at day of the green so your heads are going <laughs> this is insane um first you know it's one of our first tours to america which is a big thrill for any band and then to have this coming over because we're all massive mad zeppelin fans we're like we're there we're there tell us what so it turns out that it was two weeks later so we had to get a cheap rap run down motel by the freeway uh with I a green swimming pool <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just camp out there for a couple of weeks with like 18 wheelers going by 24 7 in the room shaking in the bed shaking but you do <laughs> what you do right man you do whatever you got to do to get to that next show so there we were and we never played in a, in, a, in, a, in a stadium like that before so you drive up and you oh my god this is the way we're playing and then the 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 most crazy part is that we went on stage really really early because i think there was like a 4 p.m curfew that day so okay. we went on stage really really early and i remember we went up there and uh, the fog was still rolling enough like it does yeah. and uh we could see thousands of people you know in the in the, the, the general admission area on the floor and they're all like screaming and yelling and so forth and then the fog lifts and then you see this is like crazy like 10 o'clock in the morning there's like eighty thousand people there oh, man yeah. you know and we had two shows like that back to back and i gotta say that for us for priests that was a a very important moment for us in breaking us in in california to, to a great extent because everybody came from all over to that particular well, it wasn't show. just a stadium rob it wasn't just a stadium it was the coliseum it was the yes. oakland coliseum the and coliseum. i know that hotel yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I saw a picture of that the other day. It's still there, right, Roxy? The the, the building is still it, there. It's still there. The, the Oakland still... Raiders don't play there. Yeah, the Oakland Raiders don't play there anymore. They've moved to Las Vegas. To Vegas but that hotel yeah. that you're yeah. talking about, that rundown still hotel, there. it's still it's definitely still there. <laughs> I wonder if it still has the orange carpet. <laughs> in the seventies, in the seventies, you know, the decor in the seventies, everything was like bright tangerine and orange and yellow oh, yeah. and white. you try trying to lay in bed and you got all this stuff flashing around your eyeballs <laughs> well how does it feel today to know that for pretty much every band that goes on before judas priest you are that zeppelin band you know you have become sort of the band that everybody goes oh shit i get to play with judas priest tonight it's the way we 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 kind of pass the rock and roll baton or the rock and roll torch or torch. call it metal. But I always say rock and roll because when I say that, it's everything, all kinds of music, metal. Um, <laughs> but that's what we do, you know. We're living. The great thing about it is that we're living the same lives, aren't we? Regardless of where you're at, we're all getting in the van. Get in the van, you know. We're all getting in the van. <laughs> we still get in the van. <laughs> <laughs> to get from the air, we fly, get into the van, go to the show, fly, you know, get in the van, back to the plane, it's like, up. you're still getting in the van. You're living the same life, you're living the same dream, you still have the same great expectations and journey that you're on. You're making music, you're making songs, you're making records. We can look at each other without, without having to say a thing, and we know that we both live the same life, you know, and that's, a, that's the joy of being in a in a band. I call it passing the torch of rock and you can call it the, uh -huh. the banter and, 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 and uh, the scepter, whatever you want. I think it, we're, we're on to the same exact uh, uh, wavelength for that, for sure. And I believe in that a hundred percent. I'm moving on again, going back to that book. If we can have a picture of that book, Vic, if you can put it up, there it is, folks. Um, you can go out and buy it with the audio version spoken by Rob Halford. He is our guest today on In the Trenches, a special artist spotlight episode of In the Trenches. Thank you for listening. And uh, again, if you want to subscribe on one of these channels that our producer will put uh, the subscribe button on, that'll be great. And uh, Although the book is worth the price of admission, just with the soul-bearing recollections of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll circus that surrounded Judas Priest, uh, 
up to this day, I'm sure, with an emphasis a little bit, if you will, on the sex in the book. Let's just be honest about that. But I'm curious, just a, a little as to why more time was not spent covering the years between Priest. Because there's a ro- lot of Rob Halford fans that want to know about those years, those two and a half fight albums, street metal band, the, the two album, which kind of morphed into a bit of an industrial metal, and then the four Halford albums that you've had since. So just a little, um, you know, those years. What happened there? Well, when we came to the end of these 50 odd hours of talking of one on one, we had closing in on almost four, 400,000 words. I know it was in excess of 350,000 words. And the publishers went, woo. <laughs> it's like that okay. moment in that great movie about <laughs> Mozart. There's too many notes. What? There's too many <laughs> notes? <laughs> Which notes don't you want? So now you go, you go into this world of much like when we make a record sometimes, you go into the world of editing. And so uh, I went from the, I want every word in my book, da, 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 you know, diva moment, to understanding the value of editing a book to get the pacing, to, to get the flow, much like making a record, uh, to get all that side of it compact and concise and moving. And so there were those moments that you talk about, we did talk about uh, uh, quite, a, quite in depth. So we have a lot of stuff left over. And I feel that at some point we will get into that part of, um, of the, the, the missing confession section Never that might be. <laughs> bonus, bonus material. Yeah, bonus. I, I, exactly. I, I can tell. Maybe, maybe they'll come out as B sides on the uh, Christmas and on the, on the maybe the next Christmas album that comes out. You never know, right? <laughs> you never know. Never say never for sure. <laughs> We did talk about that fascination that you do have with Christmas because, you know, I did talk, I, I mentioned the, the fight albums, the two albums, the, the Halford albums, but you also have two Christmas albums out, which is incredible. And, and we talked right before we actually hit the record button that, uh, and maybe we'll have that in our bonus material, uh, that, uh, there might be a third, uh, Christmas album folks down the road. You never know. You know, you never know. I, I had so much fun making Celestial with my brother Nigel on drums and my nephew Alex on bass, Ian Hill's son, and their friends. It was just a joy. I, I've all, I, as a as a family, and having some of the musical uh, musically inclined family members, I'd always thought I'd love to do something with with my brother and my nephew, and didn't know what what or when or how we, we were going to make this happen. And then once I uh had the green light from my great label epic uh, 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 uh they, they said um they said yeah you know just go make another christmas album leave it to you. you you you've made a few songs in your life so you get on with it and we'll 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 take take care of the distribution and everything else um so uh it was it was just fantastic it was just fantastic just to to have that I said it's a bit like the heavy, the heavy metal. Um, or what was that the American TV musical family show? Oh, that big TV series. The, oh, the Partridge Family. Yes, the heavy metal. The Partridge, Partridge Family. family. Yeah. Yeah. That was my hero, Keith Partridge. Partridge Family. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I had a blast. I had a blast, and um, it, it's been so well received. In fact, just the other day we were talking about uh, reissuing some more special vinyl for uh for the, the end of this year hopefully um wow. it's um it's something that we love you know we'll we'll play music at christmas time and there you go let's go let's do well speaking of albums i just like your quick take on uh, one of priest's most critically acclaimed albums painkiller it came out in 1990 it was your 12th studio album um so many critics uh call this you know quintessential, I can't say it, but the critics can, quintessential metal. It's important metal. Um, how did this album come out so great? If you, again, had the, the good grace of, of a long life in, in in music, and I mean, we're talking at 90, 1991, it's 2021 now, but <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd already made a bunch of records. And I think the feeling was that there was this kind of 
in a search of, of really making a definitive metal album with a, a real definitive amount of intensity and energy and power that was almost relentless, which is what that record turned out to be. There's only a moment where we pull back a little bit with uh, with uh, Touch of Evil. That in itself is a, is a very potent song, but everything that surrounds that one track, it's just full raw. It's 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 all it's way past eleven, you know. So <laughs> you've got all this. It was your twelfth studio album, so this album actually went to twelve. <laughs> there you go, there you go. So I think I think in terms of reasserting ourselves and just as a band hiding away in Miraval Studios in the south of France in this beautiful chateau and. You know, just switching off the the rest of what was going on around us, so we could really focus, and then be as a band together in the same room and work together. Uh, it was just a very, a very, uh, uh, very tight, deep kind of personal um, revelation that that we had. And of course, working with the late great Chris Tangaridis as producer, uh, twiddling the knobs, he did an, an, an amazing job. I think it, it, it was it was an important album. Um, not just for not just for metal as it turned out to be. I mean, you, you have no idea that it's going to get that value. But um, for ourselves, it's like okay, we've made this record and this record and this record. It's not like what's left to do. It's just a, again a reaffirmation. We're we're a heavy metal band. We're going to make the be the best, strongest, powerful, most energized, exciting heavy metal album that we can make at this time. And uh, that's what we set out to do. Well, fast forward up until your, you know, to your latest release, which is Firepower. I feel it has the same energy, and I don't know how you guys are able to do it, album after album, but still kicking ass with uh, Firepower. And of course, you have the, you know, the great addition with Richie Faulkner. Love the guy. Love his playing. Uh, brings a great energy to the band. Um, my, you know, my question is the, the collaborative songwriting process, you know, between whether it's with, you know, uh, Painkiller or if it's up, up there now with um, Firepower. How has that songwriting process changed with all these different bands and different lineups over the years? And maybe even right now, as you prepare, as you prepare for your new album, how is all how does all that process happen, that creative process, when you're used to being next to each other in a room, now you're doing it long distance? Yeah. Well, I'm old school. You know, we had one great big writing session last March for this new record that we're still working on. And what I mean by that is, 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 is Glenn and Richie and myself, Glenn's beautiful studio. Uh, and, and that's the way I personally write. I, I'm very spontaneous in my writing, you know. And uh, even before the, the lyrics and the melodies start, I'm there with, 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 with Glenn and Richie, and I'm inspired and motivated by what they're doing. Here's the thing. The moment that we decided we were going to have two lead guitar players in the band, that's, that was the, the kicker for us, and still is now. We have two lead guitar players, you know? Yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll... I know that's, that's quite common to, for, for, for a lot of bands, but for us at that time, at the, at the place in metal, that was, that was something special and different and new. KK so, and Glenn, there was never, there was, there was never, uh, there was never superiority. It was always a good balance. It, it's, always a good and, balance. And, and, yeah. and, and with Richie, Richie comes in and does the same thing. You guys balance off each other. And it, and I think that's a great, perfect way to look at a two guitar player band. It is. That's perfect. Spot on. It's spot on because you can't have two guys doing the same kind of lead break things with the same kind of style, the same kind of feel. You know, um, no. uh, that's that's what that's what brings these these two great different dynamics from from the guitars. Um, but uh, I, I've always likened um, lead guitar players a little bit to singers. You know, especially if you if you li really listen to Glenn's phrasing. One of the greatest lead guitar breaks that, that Glenn ever did was in Beyond the Realms of Death. And if you really listen to the phrasing of, of, of his guitar passages, it's like singing. you're listening to a voice singing, you know? Yeah. It's just so yeah. beautiful. And so um, there's that great texture that having two guitar players can bring, uh, 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 and especially lead guitar players. Um, 
the lead guitar is like a, it's like the human version of the voice for me. <laughs> uh, and and they're telling stories. No, there <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely exactly. is. You know, exactly. if you can tell a story that helps support the song with the guitar solo, and you can actually make your guitar sing. There's, you know, one of my favorite guitar players, Brian May, does that. You know, constantly with his soloing, um, and obviously with the two guitar player bunch. Now, of course, Richie's in the band as well. But you know, just the ability for both the guitars to harmonize like that. Do you, do you ever come up with in, in your voice comes in as a harmony voice as well? Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, you get like a, a screaming lead break guitar, which is like a screaming vocal painkiller voice, or you get a really bluesy kind of soft textured lead guitar break, which again might be a reference to, Oh, I don't know, like something off, off, off. there's a beautiful guitar a piece in um in uh sea of red from from firepower and uh and so i love that you know I, i've always been a frustrated guitar player tried time <laughs> and time again to play it's yeah. such a complex instrument I, I you know kudos to guys like yourself i don't know how you do it i don't you i don't know how you remember where to put your hands you know because it's, it's such a it can be such a complex instrument. You but, don't know uh, how no. much we feel the same way about you. <laughs> you you know what? You are a Les Paul through a Marshall stack when you sing Green Manalisi with a two prong <laughs> crown. And you sing and you sing that 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 solo part is about as lead guitar as any voice could ever get for me. So thank you for thank you, thank you for well, putting thank that. Thank you back. That's really cool. Thanks. Is there is there anything you can tell the diehards that are waiting with bated breath about uh, studio album number nineteen? Is there or are they just going to have to check your Instagram because you are posting all the time on Instagram? Um, but is there any sort of uh, Easter egg that you can give them? You know, a bit like Christmas, it's the joy and expectation of of, of something special about to happen. And I think if you uh, if you tell what tell somebody what's in under the wrapping paper. It's a mixture of elation and deflation, you know. So I think it's 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 best to uh, it's best to. Uh, I think Andy Warhol said something about some of the greatest things in life are about expectation, about a surprise, about not knowing what's going to come at you, you know. And that's the great thing about music. Uh, but it's one of the one of the joys we have as musicians, especially when we get really you know, fired up about a, a song or a, a bunch of songs or a complete record. And our fans do the same. I'm the same as a fan. You know, I'm a fan like you are of, 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 of bands that we that we that we're into and that we dig. So um, all I'm I'll just wondering is, if Andy War. I'm wondering if Andy Warhol to told you that about uh, when you met when you went out with him in New York because I think that's in the book too, right? The story of you and Andy <laughs> Warhol having a little bit of an escapade. Is that when he dropped that information on you? <laughs> well, actually. The, Actually, that was just one of his many Andy Warhol comments that I read at the time way back in a, in a, in a magazine. But, um, yeah, that's a very cool story. You'll have to check out Confess about my handcuffing Andy Warhol and taking him to Studio 54 together in a yellow <laughs> cab in New York City. But, um, but what I'm saying is as far as, as, far as this, this, uh, the place that, that all musicians enjoy, being creative, being in a room, with your bandmates and making a song and go, oh man, I can't wait for the fans to hear this, you know. Um, Firepower was a, was a beautiful achievement for us. We were very, very proud of, of that record. And of course, when you set a bar, you're always trying to go, oh, now we've got to try and, you know, knock one out of the park with with, with the follow-up to Firepower. That can be a danger. I think you can get very easily um, misdirected uh, by focusing too much. Uh, on again expectation i think that we've been making music so long we never second guess the, the final outcome we've always played from the heart from the gut you know these these songs that i've got with me um they're so they're so good i'm so happy and so proud of what we've got so far and there's so much more to it's come a pleasure to hear you, man you may have heard that we're, we're going to get the, the team together um andy and and tom and, and uh mike exeter uh, that was a great experiment. We didn't even know it was going to work. You know, Tom's old classic old school metal, um, right. and he's from more recent times. Uh, Mike, of course, he just came off the 13 album with with Sabbath and done a lot of work with Sabbath. So these three heads working together with, oh, this is they're going to be a train wreck or something glorious, and it turned out to be something glorious. So 
we're going to at least recreate those same uh, production moments. But uh, having said that, it is all about the songs. It is all about the songs. And right now, the songs feel really, really strong. And um, I can hear your metal. excitement in it. I couldn't be happier for you. I couldn't be more proud. And, you know, just you sitting down with us today on In the Trenches just to talk about the book, of course, uh, which is Confess, folks. And you're going to uh, go out and check that out one more time. Uh, we will provide the links all in the description of the uh, video as well. But just to spend the time, Rob, and talking a little bit about rock, um, it's been great. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on in the trenches. I've had a blast, man. I've had a blast. We'll have to do it again. I've got, I've got so much going on every day, and 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 I'm just delighted that we've been able to have this uh, this quick uh, this quick rock and roll chit chat together. But we'll do it again, okay? We'll do it. Uh, I, do think it so. I think so. I think it's a, it's a definitely a must, folks. Uh, we'll be able to maybe and maybe even sometime in 2021 or maybe in 2022, uh, we'll meet up at some sort of festival somewhere, and uh, you know. Just uh, until then, I'll I'll be stalking your uh, Instagram. All you folks should be out there too, because Rob does post. Do you do you pretty much post every day, or do you you know you're really active on social media, which is you know not a common thing for an iconic household name. <laughs> uh, three or four times a week. Um, Love it. There's there, there is there is there is believe it or not a, a thing as too much, you know. Uh, so I kind of I kind of uh, take my time, but I do it myself. I, I, that's just the way it is for me. Um, man, we got to get back on the road. I miss <laughs> being on the road. Yeah. You know, I'm I miss hearing that hotel drill at six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, the drill! I'm like two hours of sleep. You know what I'm talking oh. about, right? It's, yeah, well, no, you. It's always that time, but you know what? I I have that every single Wednesday uh, when they do street cleaning out right outside the door of the apartment because now because it's snowing, we have big bulldozers that are hitting the ground, and it sounds exactly <laughs> like that drill. I know exactly what you're life on about. the road, man. Life on the road. You, you know, it's it's a love hate relationship, but I tell you, we all miss our fans, don't we? We miss being with our fans. We miss playing live. We miss our buddies in you know the bands and. Uh, Thank the Lord is slowly getting through this pandemic together. And I tell you, we're going to really have a have a great revelation here with regards to fully understanding the power of music, the power of live shows, the power of needing each other in what we do. So bring it on, man, because we're all ready to get out there and uh, turn up the amps your, and get your positivity get is infectious, Rob. I, I'm telling you, man. And I'm again, I can't uh, be more excited for the for the new album coming out. Well, we'll just call it number 19 at this point. But uh Damn, I'm and I'm looking forward to seeing what mountain we're going to choose to uh, chisel your face in as one of the forefathers of metal. Right? We we did come up Let's with that idea on, that. on this one. Let's get on the mountain of rock. Yeah, I yeah, love it. Sure. So, folks, Rob, stay on for just one more second because, folks. Uh, we are going to wrap this one up and uh, thanks again for showing up and for being in the trenches uh, with Rob Halford. Again, his book, Confess, and uh, he sings for this little band called uh, Judas Priest. You might have heard of him, um, but Rob Halford, we'll see you next time. And the rest of you, until next episode, enjoy the ride. Trenches with Ryan Roxy. That, that was great. Thank you so I had a much. Blast. Rob. I had a blast, Dude. man. Really, let's do it. Let's do this again. We, we could we could such a great guy. It. I just want to bring the other guys on just to say hey and just say, you know, there's Joey that helped out get this as well, and there's Vic. So thanks, guys. Hey everybody. Hey everybody. What a great team, a, great it, production, really good show. Rob, I, I'll let you know when we. I'll, I'll send you some some links for it. And uh, Vic, what were you going to say? I was just going to ask, why do you have the the hat for the USS Milius behind you? Oh well, uh, quick story. I'll make it quick. My stories are never quick. Um, <laughs> there was a guy that used to come to our shows a lot. He was a commander. He's retired now. He's a commander in the in the United States Navy. Massive metalhead. Um, we got to meet him after the show. He was head of the Pacific Fleet public relations team. So he did all of the 
pictures, all the news releases, everything uh, from the West Coast to the world from the US Navy. So I was living in San Diego at the time, and he calls me up one day and he goes, do you want a private tour of a ship? I'm like, yeah, because <laughs> I mean, it's just a, it's just a thrill to be uh, to be given that kind of honor because I, I'm, I'm such a supporter of, of the armed forces all, all over the world. Um, so I get a cab back to the dockyards in in in, in, um, in uh, San Diego, and it's funny he had his full gear on the, the admiral, the commander, you know, and all this business. And other other side walk by, and they have to sort of stand still. I'm like, this is this, this, this is the same guy I see at the front row going. <laughs> Like it is. <laughs> but uh, but but they took me down to the ship to the Milius. I didn't know it was going to be the Milius, which is a very famous ship if you Google it. Right. Um, and uh, I was amazed because we're at the gangplank, and there's the captain with most of the crew, and they're standing on the side of the ship. You know, and I'm going, "What is this? Is this for you?" I said, "No, no, this wow. this is a real thrill for them. We got so many metal maniacs on the Milius. So, no like, oh my God, you know, so." Got the gangplank. They give me the old whistle thing, and I'm, uh, he said, "He said, I decided to the captain, can I, can I come aboard, sir? Like, can I make him aboard, sir? Yes, you may come aboard." And then they ring this bell, you know, and, uh, and then they took me on this beautiful um, uh, ship to what is it, stern to whatever uh, of, of the Milius. It's a fascinating uh, trip, and uh, at the end of it, they gave me this uh, this beautiful cap as a as a memory. So there's the story of the Mrs. Milius. Great. <laughs> well, thanks, Rob. Again. I got a lot, really of, them, a lot of stories it. like that. You <laughs> that know didn't what? Go in the book. <laughs> part two. Part two, and, part and all two. the bonus material as well. All right, I love it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks again, guys. Rob. I'm. It's midnight for me, so you have a great rest of your day. I'm going to bed, folks. Vic, I'll call you tomorrow. Yep. Uh, Joey, thanks, buddy. Thanks again, Rob. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Cheers, guys. guys. All the best. Thank hey, you. Nice you bye bye now. Bye. bye. Thank you. Hopefully you can get on there. Yes. yes. Hello, Rob. How you hey doing? Guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Have you got me? Yeah, it takes a couple minutes for the uh it just takes a little couple minutes for the internet to catch you in there, but uh you're looking uh, great. Right. Perfect. Okay, man. Good, um, good. I have good. my producer Vic is uh behind the screen. Maybe he can come on for a second and say hello and just tell you what he'll we'll be doing. Hi, Rob. But, Hello, Vic. How are you? Great. Nice to meet you. Good, man. Nice to meet you, too. Are you in Phoenix right now? Yes, I am. I am. Oh, I've, just been on, uh, I've just been on Fry's trying to book my COVID jab. <laughs> are you talking about now, Fry's Electronics? <laughs> yeah, it's almost. Well, <laughs> hey, is that, still place, is that place still going, the Fry's Electronics? I used to go to the I one just, down. Um, oh, where where is it? Is it on, on baseline? Uh, in I Phoenix. know. Yeah, and you know that I, I. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I I spend a lot of time in Phoenix because Alice lives there. Do you ever do you ever run across Alice? <laughs> we bump each we bump into each other at Sky Harbor <laughs> usually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are. Where Hi. have you been? Oh, I just came back from Europe. Oh, I just got back from South America. You know, it's that world that we live in. You know, musicians. We're often, we're often kind of uh, chasing each other's uh, two bus coat tails, aren't we? And uh, <laughs> everybody seems to think we're hanging out at the clubs and the whatever, uh, but we no. don't because we're always in different parts of the world. But um, anyway, there you go. Yeah, it's lucky if it's a photo if it's a photo op in someone's dressing room for about two or three minutes. I think that was the last time I saw you. <laughs> yeah, it was at uh, at the Christmas pudding about two years ago, I think, um, yes. which is a great, great, great thing that Alice does. I, I, I can't wait to to go and hang out another at another one of those really important and thoroughly enjoyable events. That, uh, they're just so much fun, you know, on, on every level. So fingers crossed. We may get one this Christmas, if not definitely next Christmas. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, everyone said to say hello. Uh, Nita Strauss, I was talking to her earlier, and she said, to, you know, make sure you give them a big hello from me. And I said, no problem. 
So you know, I was looking at um, some footage uh, the other day of uh, when I last when I did a, a Christmas pudding with um, and Slash was there and Nita was there and Richie Faulkner, Dave Allison, and I'm sorry, who's your drummer? Who's the, who's, who's Glenn, the drummer? Sobel. Glenn, Glenn Sobel? Glenn Sobel. Yeah. And they're all we're all cracking away doing breaking the law. Look, we're all looking thoroughly bored because musicians hate rehearsals, right? So we just lower them. Oh, God, we've got to rehearse. We have to rehearse because it's important to stand up of your game. But at the same time, we're like, oh, okay, you know, and I'm wandering around, I'm breaking the law, breaking the law. And uh, <laughs> of course, that flips once you get in front of the crowd, you go, you go nuts. But uh, it was just great watching Nita come in away there, you know, she's an, an amazing guitar player. That's great. Uh, you know what? She's going to love the fact that you said that. Get out of the way. So, yeah, you know what? Save that thing about Christmas because I do want to talk to you about you have a definite fascination with Christmas. You've made two Christmas albums, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have. And I, I love making them. You know, um, Christmas isn't Christmas without music. It's, it's, it's so important to us for that time of year. And so, um, I can't remember how the, the very first Christmas record win songs came about. It was just uh, a, a suggestion that I made to the guys that I was working with at the time, the musicians I was working with at the time. And everybody's like, yeah, let's do it, man. You, you should be a lot of fun. So we went ahead and we made, um, we made win songs. And then uh, almost a decade later, I'm talking to... Um, to Scott from my label in New York from Epic and yeah, do, can I make another record? I'd like to make another uh, Christmas record. And yeah, man, we'd, lo we'd love to, we'd love to have that on board. So um, two albums and the second one was a lot of fun because you probably know I, I did it with my brother, Nigel on drums and my Perfect. nephew, Alex, Ian Hill on bass and some of their mates. So it's very much like a family affair. Um, but both of them um, were just a, just a real pleasure to do because I love Christmas. So many of us love Christmas. It's a great time <laughs> of the year, whether you believe in it or not, from whatever angle you're looking at it from. But, um, but yeah, Celestial was the last endeavor. And um, I know there's a bunch of other Christmas songs floating around out there that I could uh, probably get my metal teeth into at some point. So who knows? We might make it to three... Three Pete is what I call it. I can tell you when you talk about what you believe in, I believe in Santa Claus still. And I, I, I can see with the beard, if you're growing it in, there might definitely be a third album coming out, right? Oh, yes, with, with, with a stage show. Uh, this is the COVID <laughs> thing. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> you know, well, I'm one of these guys that hates to shave. And uh, all of this from up here went down here. I got, you. Yeah, well, I got the beanie. Friends, I got the beanie. Mine's slowly going, but that's well, why I wear I a know. beanie. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. But yeah, so you know, maybe if uh, maybe you'll see me down at uh, I don't know Scottsdale Fashion Mall in the corner of Santa this Christmas time. I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You got to make but some money somehow. You can yeah, just you know. <laughs> make a shekel here and there. But I tell you, it's been funny. This is because I know you're very active on social media like i am yes. and uh, there's a debate going on about should he should he keep the beard should he not keep the beard it's like tom it's like tom from slayer he had a great beard yay but halford's beard is better and all this, this crazy stuff but it's a it's a nice little diversion yeah for sure that's what i love about you and social media because you're an iconic guy but you are have such a close relationship with your fans and you're really active on Instagram, especially because you, because you say it right on your bio, you go, I post and you do. I went and checked it out today. Yeah, I do myself. That's just the way it works for me. You know, I know for some people it's difficult with the schedules and so on and doing a bunch of other things, but um, I, 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 it's enjoyable a way to keep in touch with our fans as you know, without our fans, we've got nothing. So it's uh, it's become um, a little bit of a paint yourself in a corner thing with these cat t-shirts that I started. I don't know how that <laughs> kicked off, but everybody loves the cat t-shirts, right? And uh, so I'm kind of running out of cat t-shirt choices uh, at the moment. But I uh, 
I came across an amazing Bathory T-shirt the other day and put that on this weekend. I stood outside in the Biocactus. And uh, that's, I think that could be the next place I'm going to go to. So I might not, I might have to go down to Coops and knock on the door. You got any shirts I can wear, <laughs> Alice? You know, I'm really nice. You guys spend way too much time in shopping malls, man. I'm over yeah. here at the North Pole. I'm in, I'm in Sweden right now. So you're probably the only place in the world right now where the sun is shining bright. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a pleasure. This is one of the, this is one of the great joys of living here in, in the Valley, as you know. I moved here. Uh, I moved to uh, first, for my first experience of Phoenix, which I talk about in this book here. Confess was we did a show in Las Vegas at. Um, I'm pretty sure it was the Aladdin, which is not no longer there. It's the old Las Vegas. You know, I would drive down the or the bus would drive down the strip. And you would see, you would see marquees with the uh, Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones, and Frank Sinatra. Sonny and Cher, Elvis, you know, this is At like the 70. Sands Hotel. That's yeah. it. That's it. So we did the show that night and then we did the equivalent of an overnighter, which, of course, an overnighter from Phoenix to from Vegas to Phoenix is like what, four hours and change. So we got okay. into the valley. It was in the summer. I got off the tour bus and it was absolutely roasting hot. You know, the summers are like here. And so I'm like, man, this is crazy. You know, it's like four in the morning. It's a hundred and something outside. I wake up the next day, and of course I see this beautiful valley of the sun, and uh, it just hit me big time. And uh, in, in my trips that I would make uh, from that point on, um, I slowly put some roots down. And this this house that I'm in here, in PV, I got this house in '86, and this is my uh, this is my little Shangri-La. But this is the time of year, man. You know, some of our fellow. Um, some of our fellow metalheads in various parts of, of, of the states right now are, are shivering and bundled up. There's a terrible crisis going on in Texas. I hope they get that fixed soon with the electricity. They, they, I know. Down. From what I heard, they, they they actually broke the power grid. But I, I tell you, you, what, you, did I, tell you what, I was just going to say, just quickly talking about the weather. You know, uh, even in my hometown in Walsall, we have like two inches of snow and everything grinds to a halt. And in Sweden, they get like six meters of snow. And everything just carries on as usual. No, you know? I'm toasty. I'm I'm actually warm indoors, but there is about three feet of snow out right now where I'm from. But the thing is, you did it the right way. Like you went it, you grew up in the UK, you grew up outside of Birmingham, right? And then but yeah. then you moved to where the sun is. Me, I grew up in California, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, but then I moved to Sweden. What's wrong with me? <laughs> well, you know, I think this is the great joy that we have as musicians. We're blessed, aren't we? Because we see so much of the world. And when we make our travels, we come to these places and it's difficult to describe. I dare say it's the same for you, Roxy. That you, you're in Sweden. You go, man, I love this place. This is making me feel like a special way. And then... You know, you go back again and again, and then you decide to maybe rent a little place like I'm here in Phoenix. And it's a joy. It's an absolute joy. I'm sure you've got a list of places that you look forward to when you're back oh. out on the road that, uh, that you always enjoy returning. It's, it's the people, too, of those places. Yeah. Like a Scandinavian crowd is a very uh, intellectual, metal, but passionate crowd, which is great but completely different than a South American passionate crowd, which is, you know, over the top when, and that's a certain vibe as well. And then you go down to Italy. So you, I mean, uh, for so many years with Judas Priest, you have all these pockets of different uh, amazing audiences, right? It's been sensational in the way that we've seen metal grow from its roots, from its infant roots and its little metal diaper <laughs> coming from the West Midlands. <laughs> With Priest and Sabbath, you know, Priest formed in 69, and then I think Sabbath was like 66, possibly around the same time, I don't know. But in, in, in a, you know, the same neighborhood around the Birmingham area. And then we took this metal to places in the world that had never heard of it before, never experienced the sound, never saw a band, but it just created a, a real strong sensation. And as we progressed, you know, and other bands came along in, in various forms of metal, we built this amazing metal community around the world. And absolutely right, you know, um, each country 
has its own very special, uh, unique way of displaying the affection towards the stage. And you just made a great, um, you've made a great example there. But man, to see it now at this at this place where it is so massive, it, it's just a joy to to watch and and and, and listen to. You're definitely one of the forefathers of metal. Do you think you, your face will be emboldened on a uh, like Mount Rushmore? When they find a, <laughs> a perfect metal uh, sort of mountaintop, they should probably have your face as one of the forefathers of, of metal, I think. I'll tell you that. Hey, that's a great idea. I think <laughs> maybe we should leave Rushmore to the politicians. We should find another that's mountain true. range. We'll, we'll find another some- place. <laughs> yeah, we should put like Lemmy up there and Ronnie James Dio and a few other, you know, the great Chris Cornell and so on and so forth. I know, I know what we can do. We can ask them on Instagram. We'll ask your followers on Instagram what they want, who else they'd like to see hey, on the mountain. That's, that's a very cool idea. We'll get that. The mountain of rolling. rock. Yeah, the mountain of rock. The mountain I of love rock. It. Brilliant. <laughs> So here we go. We're, I mean, obviously, I'm going to take a lot of the stuff that we're just talking about, and uh, Vic, our producer, is going to clip this and that in. But I am, I do have a, like a small little format there. I have a little intro, if you don't mind. I'm going to say it. Sure. I'm going to come on full screen, and then I'll sort of treat it like a little bit of a show. And then, obviously, because we're not doing it, I usually live stream it. But this is great because we're just taping it, so our producer can. You know, I, I know you're pressed for, you know, we have a short amount of time, so um, it's going to be a little bit condensed version of it. But uh, I'll start from the top and then we'll just run through it. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about the book. And uh, are you ready for it? Beautiful. Let's go.